Excellent. Well, thanks for having me, David. Um, before I jump in, I, I want to start with the caveat that I am a bottom-up investor. So when I first look at a new mining-focused investment opportunity, the, the things I look at first are management, uh, the asset quality, uh, the company's financial structure, um, upcoming company catalysts, uh, price-to-value metrics, uh, and, and the jurisdiction where the company is active in. Um, only then do I consider the actual metal at play. Uh, that said, I think even for mining investors with this bottom-up approach to security selection, we do have a responsibility to understand the market dynamics of each and every metal we have exposure to. And of the roughly dozen metals that the MJG fund um, has weighted exposure to, nickel is one that I've been following with particular interest over the past four to five years, as I think its medium to long-term future is especially bright, thanks to a decade of underinvestment and exploration and development, coupled with Nickel's unique role in the ongoing electric vehicle megatrend. So let's jump in. So Nickel's primary demand comes from the stainless steel market at roughly 70% of, of total Nickel demand. Um, remaining demand comes from specialty alloy steels, uh, Nickel plating, which can be thought of as a thin layer of Nickel coating on a metal object, as a metal casting additive, and yes, and lithium ion batteries. Um, as can be seen in this Nickel price chart, we are well off the metal's all-time high of nearly $25 per pound, reached in early 20, uh, 2007 at the peak of the Chinese-driven commodity boom. Uh, 13 years later, you'll see that the nickel price is roughly 75% below the all-time highs reached in 2007. If you look closely at the chart, you will see there was a small spike higher in 2019. Um, nickel reached roughly $8.50 per pound in Q3 of, of last year. Uh, this was due to the Indonesian government announcing in early September that it was banning uh, nickel ore exports from the country starting January 1st, 2020. So th this, this regulation is already in effect. Um, Indonesia's rationale for the export ban was to accelerate the construction of nickel smelters in the country so that Indonesia can sell value-added nickel products versus exporting the raw product to China and letting China uh, create downstream margin. This was big news, given that Indonesia is the world's largest producer of nickel, accounting for roughly 25% of global production. Um, however, in the month since this ban was officially announced, the nickel price has declined and given back most of its gains uh, and sits at roughly $5.50, $5.60 per day uh, today. Uh, this is due to the uh, supply constraints uh, stemming from the Indonesian ban being outweighed by worries about global, uh, global economic growth and then more recently, the impacts of the coronavirus. So notwithstanding the short-lived bump in the nickel price in 2019, as can be seen in this next chart, it has largely been a lost decade of investment for the nickel industry. Um, this chart shows that expansion and sustaining CapEx uh, figures have dropped steadily um, from a high of roughly $15 billion in 2008 to a low of $5 billion in 2018 as the nickel price has remained in the doldrum for, uh, for much of the past 10 years. Well, while I don't have a chart handy, you can be sure that nickel exploration expenditures have seen an even more extreme decline over this period, uh, having almost dried up entirely in the 2013 to 2016 time period. Uh, but in the mining industry, the best cure for low prices is low prices. And this is what happens when a given metal underperforms for an extended period of time investment in exploration, investment in development, investment in expansion and sustaining CapEx, all that dries up. And additionally, supply comes offline. Um, and we've seen a recent example of that in the nickel industry when First Quantum shuttered its large Ravensthorpe nickel mine in Western Australia a couple years ago in 2017. So the dynamic that we're seeing with nickel should pique the interest of contrarian investors because generally the best time to invest in a given metal is when prices are low and producers are struggling, and not when prices are high and CapEx and investment is booming. Uh, furthermore, be, because of this lost decade, when the nickel price does begin its next sustained leg higher, the supply response will be delayed as the cupboard is largely bare for projects that can be quickly put into production. So switching to the demand side of the equation, uh, this chart from Vale demonstrates the structural shift we will see in the nickel market over the next decade uh, due to the electric vehicle megatrend. Vale expects nickel demand for batteries to grow from 3% in 2017, and we're at roughly 5 to 6% uh, today, 
all the way up to 37% of total nickel demand by 2030. While lithium ion batteries are used for all sorts of applications across uh, the world, the bulk of this incremental demand increase for nickel will come from electric vehicle batteries. I'm of the opinion that the electric vehicle mega trend is real, as it is being driven partially by consumer choice, but more importantly by government mandate. China has set a goal for 20% of all auto sales to be EV or plug-in by 2025. France has said that it will ban the sale of all new gas and diesel car sales starting in 2040. And just last week, the UK, um, which was led by a conservative prime minister, of course, Boris Johnson, announced that it would be banning sales of all non-electric vehicles by 2035. This includes gasoline cars, diesel cars, hybrids, and even plug-in hybrid cars. So very aggressive. Um, and of course, there was the news last year that the world's largest automaker, Volkswagen, um, announced that it would be going all electric by 2026. So while the pace of adoption is still up for debate, uh, this trend is very real. So shifting to the next uh, chart here, um, shifting lithium ion battery chemistries are a further cause of optimism uh, for nickel bulls. Elon Musk is on record saying that lithium ion batteries should really be named nickel ion batteries. And while I'm not generally a fan of, of Mr. Musk, I can wholeheartedly agree with this assertion. In layman's terms, a lithium ion battery consists of an electrolyte made of lithium, um, an anode made of either synthetic or natural graphite, and then a cathode, uh, which is the most expensive component of the battery. Uh, there are multiple cathode chemistries with different inputs, but the most popular and the highest performing is the nickel manganese cobalt or NMC cathode. Uh, 15 years ago, when, when lithium ion batteries were just starting to enter the mainstream, the cath NMC cathodes had a 1 1 1 chemistry, which means that by weight it was 33% nickel, 33% manganese, and 33% cobalt. However, cathodes are increasingly shifting to a more and more nickel rich chemistries, with the most uh, recent nickel uh, chemistry of, of 8 1 1, which is 80% nickel, 10% manganese and 10% cobalt. And of this 811 chemistry, we've seen a 250% increase um, in usage year, year over year, um, led by Tesla, who's using this 811 chemistry for its long range model, model threes. Additionally, battery makers such as SK Innovation and others are currently working on a nine, one half, one half chemistry. So again, that'd be 90% nickel, 5% manganese, 5% cobalt to decrease the usage of, of cobalt in particular um, further. So why do we see the shift? Why do we see cobalt being replaced by nickel? Um, there are a few reasons. The first is simple economics. On a per pound basis, cobalt is roughly three times more expensive than nickel at current spot prices. Uh, secondly, there's questions of supply risk. Uh, nickel can be found pretty evenly distributed across the globe, while currently 65% of global cobalt supply comes out of the Democratic Republic of Congo. This leaves battery makers and automakers um, at risk if, if there's a geopolitical blow up in the DRC. And then finally, there are CSR concerns, as some of the cobalt exported from the Congo regrettably is mined using child labor. And so major brands like Apple or Tesla, they, they put themselves at risk um, by sourcing large amounts of Congolese cobalt. So they, they do have an incentive to shift away from that as much as possible. So shifting to this final graph here, I'll conclude um, with a few intelligent ways that investors can gain exposure to nickel. Uh, the first point to understand is that nickel can be produced um, from two types of deposits. Uh, the first is sulfide deposits, which can be higher grade or lower grade. And then there's the laterite deposits, which can be either limonitic or saprolytic in, in composition. So in broad terms, uh, the high grade nickel sulfide deposits do provide the best margins and economics for producers. While the nickel laterite deposits are often high capex, uh, lower margin, and they do carry significantly more operational risk due to the use of high press, uh, pressure acid le leaching, or HPAL as it's known, uh, to liberate the nickel from the laterite ore. Um, there will always be demand for high grade um, and medium to large size sulfide deposits which can make money at current nickel prices, despite their depressed state. Um, and also it's a product that can be easily sold into the battery market. So one way for an investor to position themselves in nickel 
is to invest in nickel producers with high grade sulfite assets that are currently producing. Um, examples include Norilsk with its world-class mining complex in Russia or Independence Group in Western areas, which are producing sulfite assets in Australia. By the way, I'm, I, we uh, don't own any uh, of these companies in the MJG fund, so I feel comfortable mentioning them in this recording. Um, a second way to invest, which provides you know, both higher risk and a potentially much greater re uh, reward, is to invest in the handful of credible exploration um, and development companies focused on nickel sulfide assets um, that are not yet in production. Um, each of these uh, nickel sulfide explorers and developers should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, again, this is a very high-risk industry, um, exploration and development is, but uh, those with access to capital and technical teams with deep expertise in nickel sulfide um, will have the highest chances of success. And then finally, there's a third option, which provides perhaps the most leverage to nickel price increases. Um, and, and this is to invest in cashed up um, owners of large undeveloped laterite resources in its later stages. So in the pre-feasibility or feasibility stage. Um, none of these laterite projects make sense at the current nickel price. So investors need to understand that these should be considered true optionality plays. Or in essence, at current spot prices, the project is worthless. But when we do see the nickel price next breach the $10 level, uh, these projects on paper will show multi-billion dollar NPVs and will likely sport significantly higher valuations. So this is a, a potential way to get um, extreme exposure to nickel price increases by investing in laterite optionality plays. Okay, um, I think that's it for me today, right on time. Um, I hope this overview of the nickel market was helpful to everyone listening. And I'll now pass this back to David uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much.